Well, when we look at this tax package, of course, it was announced in the budget and then debated during the election campaign. The government argues it has a mandate to do this. The debate, though, really is all about that stage three. Labor's position now is to fast-track uh, stage two and pass stage one and two right now, this week, but then defer that debate over stage three until closer to when it's due to take effect in 2024. Stage three is worth an additional $85 billion. It's the biggest chunk of cash in this tax package. It benefits those on incomes of $45,000 uh, or more by essentially flattening the tax scales. Uh, from incomes of forty-five dollars to $200,000, you would only pay a 30% tax rate. That, of course, benefits those on incomes above $200,000 by about $11,000 a year would be the tax break for them. Today, the Grattan Institute has released its own analysis of that third stage of the tax uh, uh, package. In fact, the entire tax package itself. It agrees with Labor that a vote on this should be deferred until some years from now, until we have a better idea of what the state of the budget's going to be like to see if we can afford this third stage tax cut or not. Daniel Wood from the Grattan Institute joins me now for more on this. Look, um, a, a few things I want to get through here, Daniel, but let's just start with stage one and two. Uh, you're arguing that they, they are OK, we should be passing those now? Absolutely, and we particularly put emphasis on saying stage one is, is absolutely needed. We know the economy's slowing. Um, we've been going backwards on a per capita basis for three consecutive quarters now. Um, and so the economy is really looking for a bit of stimulus. Putting cash in the hands of low and middle income households makes a huge amount of sense in that environment. Stage two is, you know, a little bit further down the track. It is relatively modest compared to the size of stage three and partly gives back bracket creep. So I think certainly stage one and probably stage two have a, have a strong economic rationale. Well, let's talk about stage three then. There's a couple of points here. One is how affordable it is, given uh, how the budget's looked, and we'll come to that. The other argument here is wh whether it's going to make our tax system more or less progressive. Now, as you know, the government's been arguing since uh, announcing these tax cuts in its budget before the election um, that the top 20% of income earners are still going to pay around 60% uh, of, of all income tax. The top 1% will still pay around 17% of uh, total tax. The top 5% will still pay around 33% of all tax and so on. I want to show a couple of graphs from your report, though, today. Uh, here's one of them. Uh, this, is, uh, this is looking at uh, the amount of each person's income they're actually going to be paying in tax. And as you can see, the bottom... Uh, well, the middle 60% of income earners right now are paying 32% of their income in tax. That'll come uh, up to about 35% of their tax uh, in a decade's time under these tax changes. The top 20% of income earners, well, they're paying... Uh, right now, about 68% of their income in tax, that'll come down a touch to 65% in a decade under these changes. Um, uh, if we can bring up the other uh, graph here from your report as well, uh, that also looks at how we compare internationally on this. And, look, if people can watch closely at that screen, they'll see that right now Australia is above the OECD average when it comes to the progressive nature of our tax system. You're saying we drop below the OECD average when it comes to the progressive nature of our tax system. So, Danielle, it seems you're looking at something slightly di different to what Treasury is looking at when it says it's still going to be a progressive tax system? Well, no, we agree it will still be a progressive tax system in the sense that people on higher incomes will pay a higher share of their income, but it will be less progressive than it is today. So, as you say, we found you know, the top 20%, 10%, 5%, 1% are going to be paying a lower share of tax than they do now whereas middle-income earners will pay a higher share of tax. Um, the other thing we found um, was that if you do a historical comparison, looking at tax progressivity, the tax system will actually be the least progressive it's been since the late 1950s. Um, so it is a sizeable shift in progressivity, even by historical standards. But when I say there's a slightly different emphasis here, the government, the Treasury, seems to be looking at how much of the total tax pie is paid by high-income earners, middle-income earners and so on. You're looking at how much of an individual's income is being uh, spent on tax. Is, there, is that the difference we're looking at here? Because the government's adamant there's no change in the progressivity of the tax system. Well, look, I think if you look at the budget numbers, you would see that even on the measure they're using, um, the, the top 20 and top 20, 10% share um, do go backwards a little bit. But you're right, we're focusing on looking at the average tax rate that different groups pay. Um, and, and it's pretty clear under that measure that um, better off taxpayers are going to be paying a lower average tax rate, um, middle income earners are going to be paying a higher average tax rate. And so when you look at the impact on progressivity at all, overall, 
just shifting some of that burden, not all, but some of that burden from higher income earners to, to the middle. Let me ask you then about the affordability of the stage three tax cuts. Um, the budget right now is getting a bit of a boost thanks to a high iron ore prices. Uh, you don't want to bake in any uh, you know, ongoing spending based on what may turn out to be a, you know, a sugar hit. We see commodity prices go up and down. But why do you doubt we will be able to afford these tax cuts? Treasury seems to think it's fine. Uh, I would disagree with that characterisation. I mean, I think it just in general, it makes no sense to, to lock in tax cuts six years in advance. I mean, if tax cuts make sense in 2025, you can do them in 2025. Um, why not wait and get more information about the state of the budget? But I do think the budget numbers that the government is relying on to say that these tax cuts are affordable um, look incredibly optimistic. Um, yes, iron ore prices are high now, but as you say, <laughs> those, those things go up and down. Um, most of the economic parameters are surprising on the downside, so GDP growth is lower than it's expected, unemployment is going to be higher than expected, and there's a lot of question marks around future economic developments. Um, it may be that the government might need to stimulate if, if things head south, um, which, you know, is the right thing to do if, if that's what's needed, but it puts the budget back into the red. Um, so there are just huge question marks. The other side of things is what those numbers assume around spending restraint. And to say that we're going to be able to offer tax cuts of this size while running surpluses over the de decade, you need spending growth to be running at about half the rate it's been running out currently under this government, which is already historically low. So it would be unprecedented spending restraint to fit these within the envelope that the government is stating. Unprecedented, uh, you're saying there, to actually achieve what they've said they can achieve in the budget. That's right. So spending growth would have to be running at the lowest level of any government in the past 50 years. Um, so that's why I say unprecedented. All right. Danielle Wood from the Grattan Institute. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thanks for that.